Thank you, Warren. Welcome back. It is, uh, it's my favorite weekend of the year. Does that make any sense? I'm looking to see if anyone cares in this room. <laughs> Some weekends are better than others. So uh, we're going to continue our study uh, this morning by studying the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 17. So please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. I flatter myself in thinking that you're wondering uh, what is he doing? Uh, he left off last time with uh, verse uh, 18 of chapter 16, and now he's asking us to go to chapter 17, but uh, you, the more perceptive of you are going, okay, he's skipping over the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and going to uh, this section, and there's method to my madness, uh, Lord willing. I am supposed to fill in for Dan again in two weeks. And so the, the plan was to, I wanna, number one, I wanna finish the Gospel of Luke. That's a goal. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, I'm gonna continue in the Gospel of Luke when I preach for Dan, uh, but this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, I think is more suited to that, um, the attendees of the ministry of the word. It's more of a mixed uh, group there, more diverse uh, visitors, that, that kind of thing. And uh, this uh, class is made up really more of scholars. I mean, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, the, uh, you're going to need all the scholastic powers you can muster uh, to keep up with Luke as he guides us through what may at first uh, reading seem to somewhat um, disjointed observations of our Lord addressed to his disciples in these 10 verses. They're not disjointed. And I've tried to capture their cohesive nature with the title that I've chosen. I know you don't all have the outline, but the title is The Ideal Posture of a Disciple. So let's read these 10 verses. Jesus said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he, can, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. That's a familiar idea to you. It's expressed other places in the gospel and I'll reference that in a few moments. Verse seven, uh, which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and, and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, and I want you to consider that the idea is he's not telling them to verbally say, but to think. Uh, you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you think we're unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. I read something 
not too long ago about John Wesley uh, that brought a feeling of inadequacy and really shame uh, to me. Uh, Wesley, when he was a child, was rescued from a burning building and he, that experience of being saved uh, by a loving God who then deserved his grateful service and never left him. In serving that God, Wesley traveled 250,000 miles on horseback, averaging 20 miles a day for 40 years. He preached 4,000 sermons, produced 400 books, and he learned to use 10 languages. At the age of 83, he was annoyed that he could not write more than 15 hours a day without his eyes hurting. <laughs> At 86, he was ashamed that he couldn't preach more than twice a day. He complained in his diary that there was an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> the ideal posture of a disciple of Jesus is that of a servant. And all of the instructions the Lord gives in these first 10 verses of Luke 17 are attributes, whether stated positively or negatively, of a servant of Christ. Uh, not all of the Lord's servants are able to keep up the pace of John Wesley. Uh, not all of us are gifted in the same way, nor perhaps have the same physical uh, constitution, but we're all called to abide by his injunctions here, to not be a stumbling block to the weak, uh, to be of a forgiving spirit, to strive for strong faith, and to undertake our duties before the Lord with energy and grateful hearts. Abraham Kuyper observed, no service in itself is small, none great though earth it fill, but that is small that seeks its own and great that does God's will. It is an especially self-seeking thing that leads to the lax believer, a mere professing believer, to do something that causes one of God's precious little ones to stumble into the, in their faith so that they fall into sin. And that is to whom the Lord directs uh, this first warning. It is against the danger of Christian behavioral scandal. Uh, the consequences for such a perpetrator will be horrendous. It would be better, he says, for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. In other words, it would be better if he died a horrific death. The Lord may have had in mind as he turned to his disciples the hypocrisy of uh, the Pharisees about whom he contemptuously accused in verses 14 and 15 of the previous chapter of loving money so much that they neglected the very people they were to have been guarding and for whom uh, they were to be providers. The Lord, if you look over there in verse 15, the Lord pronounced such attitudes detestable in the sight of God. Those powerful words, detestable. Or he may have had in mind the rich man of the parable that we're, over, that we're skipping over uh, today, the closing verses of chapter 16. But the stumbling block he refers to is the Greek scandalon, uh, from which we get the word uh, scandal and uh, scandalize. It originally was a reference to the bait stick of a trap and thus represented the kind of potentially alluring object that leads to men's demise. Uh, picture the poor animal in the woods uh, who's just being what it is and living according to its nature and cannot help but be attracted to something that entices, uh, then suddenly realizing as that trap slams shut that it was a mortal mistake. But when used in spiritual matters, the word carries the idea of causing someone to stumble into sin or even unbelief. 
usually by leading them astray somehow. Perhaps the most common form of such an offense in the world which, in which we live is in the area of false doctrine. Uh, I, I, walking out the door, it was on TV, I've told you this before, we watch one program and if we don't grab that remote quick, he comes on. Uh, this one espousing false and nefarious beliefs that influence uh, those attempting to follow after Jesus to adopt wrong ideas about important spiritual truths and guide them down pathways that are opposed to the real and life-altering truths of the Word of God. There are other ways, of course. Uh, the stumbling block may be uh, sinful attitudes like arrogance, or the love of money, or legalism, or libertinism, or infatuation with obscure questions of interpretation. Uh, Jesus seems especially sensitive to the harm that could befall those he calls little ones, uh, meaning those young in the faith and especially susceptible to such distractions. Pride is contagious. Uh, so is materialism. Uh, likewise, the propensity to go down rabbit holes of esoteric philosophies favored by the intellectual elite. You hear groups of men especially involved in those kinds of conversations. A lifestyle uh, without restraint or temperance is attractive to those drawn that way uh, by nature. But increasingly often, it seems, especially today in this North Texas area where you and I live, it is moral failure uh, that serves as the tripwire, sending believers and unbelievers alike sprawling uh, to the ground, leading to both disillusionment and mocking of the faith. I don't know that it affects uh, preachers and leaders uh, more than others, but it sometimes seems that way because of the publicity when the scandal is uncovered. The higher one climbs, the more calamitous uh, the fall, and, and usually the wider the collateral damage. Well, Jesus says such a scenario is inevitable. Why is it inevitable? It's inevitable uh, because it's the world we live in, and Satan is the ruler of uh, this world. And therefore, we will sadly be accustomed to seeing the melancholy spectacle of reckless, thoughtless behavior wrecking those unfortunate enough to be in their path. Like every expression of sin and evil, Satan is ultimately uh, behind it. I mean, that's the truth. You remember that startling scene in Matthew chapter 16 after Peter had made his great uh, confession of faith when Jesus asked his disciples the question. He was talking about who do people say that I am? And then he turned to his disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And that was very commendable. And Jesus did commend him for that. But what was startling, I said it was startling. What was startling was the remark Jesus made immediately following when Peter objected to Jesus' disclosure about the coming cross, saying, God forbid, such a thing will never happen to you. And Jesus responded, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You can go look it up, Matthew 16. You are a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And that's our word, scandal on, scandal on. By objecting to the cross, Peter was intentionally attempting to place a hurdle before the Lord that would have tempted any other man. Peter would have kept him from his appointed mission. He would have caused him to stumble. That was impossible, but that was the intent. But inevitability does not excuse the kind of behavior that scandalizes uh, the weak, uh, the danger intrinsic in the behavior is evident in Jesus' words. Woe to him through whom they come. That is, I pity uh, the person. It would be better to die a gruesome death than reap the judgment for the spiritual harm to one of these little ones. I think, uh, I think we could all 
uh, when given the opportunity, confess that as we've lived the Christian life for years and years, decade after decade, uh, all of us are humble enough and perceptive enough to live in fear that one day I'll do that. One day I'll do that. Well, uh, this was an agricultural society, and the millstone was the heavier of the two stones employed at a mill to grind the grain uh, that was poured into this hole at the top. It was so heavy a donkey was uh, typically used to, to pull and to pull the stone around. That's all we really need to know if one was forced to have a millstone stone hung around one's neck and be thrown into the sea, the result would be a terrible death, especially if you're not keen on drowning like me. I don't want to die that way. Other ways, I'll take it when it comes. I don't want to die that way. Uh, we don't live on a farm, uh, so think maybe rather of your favorite mobster movie and uh, the villain who threatens his victim with cement boots and a swim in some filthy big-time city river, and, and you get the idea. Well, this raises an issue that I frankly don't have an answer for. What could be worse for a believer, and I do think he envisions here both true believers and pretending believers, what could be worse than such a horrible death? He says it would be worse to die a death like that. It's unlikely he had in mind, as Kent Hughes suggested, I hate to disagree with someone as esteemed as Kent Hughes, but I think it's unlikely uh, that this was a kind of, this is what Hughes said, a official dressing down in the judgment seat of Christ with shipwrecked little ones there as accusers. And Hughes reminded his readers of his, his expositional sermons uh, the, of uh, that verse out of 1 Corinthians 3, such a one is saved, yet as through fire. Uh, this doesn't seem to me uh, to fit uh, the kind of uh, merciful shame, if you can say such a thing, the kind of merciful shame a believer may endure at that judgment seat, which will be swallowed up, swallowed up immediately in glory, for we will be, as that passage states, at home with the Lord. But the lesson is that the Christian, especially the Christian leader, should be the kind of disciple of Christ who, because they are in sympathy with the Lord Jesus Christ in their regard for the little ones, will refuse to allow themselves to harm them by lax or even evil uh, behavior. That's the posture of a true servant of Christ. So be on your guard, uh, the Lord goes on to say in verse 3. Uh, there's debate amongst commentators over whether that exhortation, which can also have the sense of keeping watch over oneself, was meant to conclude the, the thought of verses 1 and 2 or introduce the next thought about the insistence on forgiving. Perhaps he meant it to apply to both, for it is a general admonition to believers to pay heed to our conduct. Pay heed to our conduct. Uh, the posture of a disciple, far from causing someone to sin, is to stand, uh, to be willing to stand against sin. So now Jesus gives instruction to the members of his church what their posture should be in those cases where a fellow brother or sister in Christ commits sin and it has become obviously known. Uh, the sin or, or sins are not uh, described, but the response is straightforward. They are to rebuke him. I'm not a big fan of that uh, translation of that word rebuke. Uh, I'm not sure that's the most accurate way of expressing the Lord's intent, which is more likely a, a serious and reproving confrontation of the brother about his sin with the goal of clearly but gently and compassionately persuading him or her to confess and repent. 
we need to reply, apply this to our, ourselves. Jesus makes it our responsibility to confront uh, the brother or sister who is in sin. And though he doesn't here give a lot of detail about what that looks like, <clears throat> most of you, I think, know that the guidelines for how that ought to occur are generally found in Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 and following. I'll remind you, it reads, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. And then the Lord uh, gives there in Matthew 18 an apparatus to use in cases where that personal and private intervention fails. He is to take one or two uh, more with him and confront him again. And if that fails, they are to tell it uh, to the church. And if he refuses even uh, to listen to the church, then they are to treat him as a Gentile and as a tax collector. In other words, they're to consider him and treat him as an unbeliever. But again, uh, that is the case of a refusal to repent. Repentance is important here. Uh, Jesus uh, mentions it twice in verses 3 and in verse 4. If he repents... Forgive him. And if he sins against you, and see now he's getting a little more personal in his instruction. If he sins against you, you're the butt now of his sin. Uh, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now we know there was nothing magical or formulaic about the number seven the expression would not exclude an eighth time, for example, or a ninth and, and, and so on. He's laying down this principle that when a sinner repents, there is forgiveness to be had. Uh, when it comes to sinful behavior, there needs to be repentance. And when there is repentance, there should be forgiveness. They go uh, hand in hand. It's only human nature to think when a professing believer continues to sin and then repent and then sin again and then repent and sin again and then repent to think that there just might be a lack of sincerity uh, here on the part of this person. But as many have pointed out before me, uh, that's not our business. Our business is to forgive. The, the, it's, it's hard, but that's our business to forgive. This is real stuff. Um, this room has got to be filled with uh, some difficult forgiveness that's happened in your lives, or maybe that needs uh, to happen. But it's one of the most endearing attributes of God, is it not? Uh, God loves to forgive guilty sinners. That's one of the most wonderful things about the Lord. He loves to forgive, and I'm so grateful for that. How often has he forgiven you? Uh, how often has he forgiven? I know he's forgiven me far too many times in, in one sense. His forgiveness is deeper than ours, deeper than ours uh, can be. Uh, and it's perfect for it. It's, it's grounded in the blood of his own Son shed for us for that very purpose. Therefore, God says he not only forgives, he forgets. It's, uh, it's the new covenant, uh, the fruit of it. He declares it in Jeremiah 31, 34, that great passage on the new covenant. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. I will remember it no more. We forgive people for things. We just keep bringing it up again. Uh, it's like we can't help it, right? Uh, but uh, God says, their sin I will remember no more. How can an infinite God forget something as heinous to him as, as sin? Uh, that's what an essayist who I read several years ago addressed and answered. It's the wrong question, the essay read. For God, it's not about forgetting. It's about remembering. Here's what God remembers. Darkness at noon. Innocence 
declared guilty, the earth reeling in horror, red, red blood of infinite value pouring unchecked from a sacred head, hands, feet. The Father, not being flesh, could not feel it in the same way as the Son, but He felt it. Did the abandonment hurt as much as being abandoned? Did the forsaking uh, rip His heart like being forsaken? There's an old gospel song that speaks of the sea of God's forgetfulness. It's an ocean of blood lapping up to the throne of judgment. That is the end of forgiven sins. They are cast into that bottomless sea where they sink completely out of mind. God remembers the cost, not the debt. But that's God in his glory, isn't it? Uh, and we are human. Uh, but there's nothing more godlike than for a person to forgive another person who has sinned against him. To forgive is divine. And the apostles, uh, listening to Jesus at that moment, uh, felt their inadequacy down to their bones. So they said to him in verse 5, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Their plea reflected uh, both that hypothetical circumstance of being sinned against, as the Lord had just described, and their own growing apprehension of the stature of Jesus in their estimation. They had been spending a lot of time with him. They had been with him day and night, day and night for weeks and weeks and months and months. They had observed him and saw in him the very willingness to forgive. He was now encouraging upon them. Uh, their own faith paled in comparison. So they knew they needed his intervention if they were going to fulfill his expectations for them. In addition to that, they had listened before when uh, the Lord made the connection between faith and forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and following, he'd used a similar illustration as he used here to make the same point, substituting there a mountain uh, for the large tree here. He said, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. And then you go to that passage in Mark chapter 11, he goes on to speak there also of the necessity of the forgiveness uh, correlating to that faith. But here in Luke 17, the Lord uh, doesn't expressly answer their request to increase our faith. Right? Rather, he mildly chastises them, exhorting them at the same time. If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree here, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The mustard seed uh, was a, a common object Jesus used to reference the smallness of a thing, whether it was actually uh, uh, whether it was actually true that it was the smallest seed or not, it was proverbial for tininess. And this mulberry tree, quite possibly, he pointed in the moment to an actual tree in their midst. Uh, this mulberry tree may have been a standard issue mulberry tree, or the equally customary, common fig mulberry tree, which we're going to see later in Luke chapter 19, the tree that Zacchaeus uh, climbed up into. Uh, the standard issue mulberry tree grew up as high as 35 feet, something like that, while the fig mulberry tree was known for its traditional deep roots that went far into the ground. Whatever the case, uh, Jesus uh, here substitutes the large intractable tree for the mountain in his previous illustration. He liked using, as you know, physical, tangible objects from his surroundings to make his point vivid. 
And so here, though, there was no good reason to engage in a pointless activity such as moving a mountain or a big tree into the sea. His point, his point was the difficulty of the outcome desired compared to the tremendous power of faith when placed in the one whose power is unlimited. True faith in God is powerful, which I once heard humorously illustrated in uh, the tale as a story of the pious old cranky woman who had not been invited to the Sunday school class's annual picnic, picnic by oversight. Unfortunately, on the day of the picnic, the organizers realized their mistake, and they sent a young man to her home to personally invite her to the picnic. But by then, the harm had already been done. It's too late, she told the young man. I've already prayed for rain. <laughs> That's some impressive faith. But it's not so much great faith that is required as the Almighty God who is the object of our faith. What we must do, this, is, this is, has great application in our, in our daily lives. What we must do when our faith is faltering, and it does, or when it is challenged, is use whatever faith that we have to petition God. It is a gift anyway. That's why they were asking for it. So we petition God. He is the one who's powerful, not our faith. If a person is to be so great in faith that he will be willing to forgive when sinned against, he must first have that kind of meekness, meaning he understands his own weaknesses and, and vulnerabilities, and then he will be free to believe that God is in control of both the offender and all the circumstances attendant to the harm that was done. We don't always have to be the sheriff. You know what, what I mean by that? This offense has taken place. My faith is failing. God seems not to be listening. I'm going to take this into my own hands. We don't always have to be the sheriff. It's okay for us to move aside and let God take that role. But then in the final verses of this section, verses 7 through 10, uh, the Lord seemingly abruptly asked his disciples three quick but connected questions, and then draws the conclusion in verse 10 with a final reflection upon the ideal posture of a disciple. The connection with what has preceded is to be found in the common experience we share as Jesus' disciples. I'm speaking of you and, and me. Uh, the moment, typically, the moment that we show the kind of faith Jesus has just committed, or we have uh, accomplished some minuscule spiritual service to him, we are immediately prone to spiritual pride, expecting some kind of reward or, or special praise. So Jesus borrows from the common practice of the day, and I just want to emphasize that. This is no affirmation of slave master. So he's talking about the common practice of the day in the world where he lived regarding the relationship between a slave and his master in order to illustrate the point he wishes to make. He, he draws upon what was then a customary uh, practice. The scene is what appears to be a small estate uh, with one slave uh, tasked with uh, the duties required to keep this estate up. And Jesus describes him uh, coming in from the field after uh, plowing or after uh, tending the, uh, the livestock. 
In other words, that part of the slave's daily duties has been fulfilled. And then come the three questions. First, does the master immediately invite his slave to sit down to dinner with him? No. Second, does he rather say, fix my dinner for me? Yes. He doesn't thank him, does he? No. Third question, for merely doing the things the master commanded him to do. That's his role. It is what is expected of him. It is, it is his proper posture. In real life, in other words, when the servant comes in from the field, you don't immediately offer him a meal. The way it actually works in real life is the slave first makes himself presentable. He washes, himself, washes up, changes clothes. Uh, then he prepares supper for the master, and only afterwards does he himself uh, take his meal, eat and drink. And this goes on day after day, doesn't it, in the life of both. So at the end of the day, uh, the master doesn't go through a, a ritual of thanking the servant. He has only done what a servant does. And then the direct application to his disciples and to you and me comes in verse 10. Uh, what servants of Christ actually do is reflect upon their blessed condition, recognizing their own unworthiness and modestly evaluating their circumstances accurately. We have done only that which we ought to have done. In other words, uh, we have been engaged in what should be the normal Christian life. Not serving as a stumbling block to others, but uh, keeping careful watch over ourselves, uh, confronting sin when we uh, see it, uh, forgiving, uh, showing faith in our almighty benefactor, uh, gladly and, and willingly assuming the ideal posture of a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our church is filled with servants uh, like that, uh, followers of Christ who work weekly uh, behind the scenes, and nobody sees them, uh, to keep this engine running. Lights are on, the air conditioner's running. It's, it's, it's a, I know some of them that do it, but I don't know all, all of them. A teacher who drives in uh, every other week from 200 uh, miles away to serve, instruct, and love us, uh, refusing praise. Don't you dare praise him. <laughs> refusing any kind of commendation, but considering it just the normal course of business in his service to the master and to his flock. Young men and women, uh, not content to just sit in their pews, but who dive in to contribute in bringing people together to form relationships in our church. Uh, nursery workers, deacons, young men, willing to devote their time to learning the scriptures and delivering their lessons uh, to the rest of us. That takes a lot of time and work. While the world labors for selfish recognition and personal benefit, their idea of success is to be faithful in servanthood, the true measure of greatness in the eyes of God. We're going to come to that scene soon in chapter 18, in which the self-righteous uh, Pharisee and uh, the, the tax collector uh, converge in the temple to pray, and the Pharisee is going to stand and pray to himself. Now, I know you know this story, but listen, he's going to stand and pray to himself, because I want you to notice this. This reveals what he's thinking. It reveals what he's thinking, and it presents a great contrast to what we've just read in our own 10th verse here. You, when you do all the things commanded you, think 
what I think what the Lord was really advising them, say to yourself, think, I am an unworthy slave. I have only done what I ought to have done. But here the Pharisee thinks, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people who are sinners. Look what all I've done. I deserve honor and glory for myself. But the tax collector, not willing even to lift up his eyes to heaven, beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. We're all merely servants of the king. You, 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 all, all of us. We're merely servants of the king, unworthy slaves. But it is the highest calling, uh, the most glorious thing we could be about. We don't have to ride 250,000 miles on horseback or preach 4,000 sermons as John Wesley did to serve him and be his faithful disciple. He gives every one of us individually differently. But to each one of us, he calls us to serve him without laying claim to any reward, but merely out of love and gratitude to him. May the Lord strengthen and sanctify us to make that our posture every day. Father, thank you for the privilege you give us uh, to be called by your name, to have received uh, your forgiveness and uh, the forgetting of uh, all our sin. Thank you for the opportunity to be your servant, to, um, with grateful hearts, uh, render back to you only what is due. May we be faithful in that. Uh, there are varying degrees of faithfulness uh, here, I know, but there are also varying degrees of faithfulness in our own lives as we live day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, May we be consistent. May we not tire or grow weary, uh, but find it our greatest pleasure uh, to live each day for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.